Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. David Cadogan, a technical manager of monogastric nutrition for Feedworks. So David, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a brief introduction about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Clayton. Sure. Uh, I'm a senior nutritionist. I work for River League, which is now part of JBS. I started off as a piggery manager. I got sick of being broke out of university, uh, but then progressed into nutrition after some time. But I love to call myself a production nutritionist and uh, been lucky to do a lot of research, went back to university uh, and have been very uh, involved in research, but also a lot of uh, product development in equipment as well as nutrition too. Anamin International Supplier of Precision Minerals. When most trace minerals are only bioavailable, Anamin trace elements are also active in the digestive tract and permit secure piglets' gut health. Gotcha. So I see that you guys have some experience using this high surface area zinc oxide rather than traditional zinc oxide and nursery diets um, and kind of looking at different benefits it may have. So would you mind sharing a little bit about what that is and what kind of effects you can see from it? Yeah, sure. I had a bit of a love-hate uh, initially uh, relationship with zinc oxide. I remember as a young nutritionist, uh, we're having some really good weaner performance and I looked at the zinc oxide, zinc oxide which was in the diet to reduce E. coli scales. And I ended up taking it out of one unit just to see how it'd go. Two weeks later, I had a phone call from the production manager uh, complaining that he had a lot of mortalities and a lot of sick pigs. And it ended up being that that zinc oxide was inhibiting the growth of hemolytic E. coli. And I realised back then that how important uh, you know, pharmaceutical grade zinc oxide was. Um, but as things progressed, uh, and the genetic uh, companies have bred uh, resistance into most genotypes, but then what uh, my main concern about zinc oxide, it, it does reduce fit intake and increases the acid buffering capacity of the diet, which is, um, you know, you want as much acid in that wiener diet as possible to enable one digestion, but also reduce uh, pathogens and come across uh, potentiated uh, zinc oxide, which is a very, very high surface area zinc oxide, unique process where it goes solubilization and the heat process too. And the high surface area of this potentiated zinc oxide, which is called Hyzox, uh, allows you to reduce uh, eight to 10 uh, fold less in the diet. And also through that process, it takes out the heavy metals. So it seems to tick all those boxes where you can have it use this unique form of uh, zinc oxide, high surface area uh, to get very similar effects. So when comparing this, this form of high surface area zinc oxide that you have to traditional zinc oxide, if you're going to, let's say, super dose that in the nursery at 3,000 parts per million, um, what would be the... Um, comparable option of using this high surface area? At what level would you put it if you want to have the same effect that you would normally get for using um, a super dose level of 3000, for instance? Yeah, typically the, uh, the potential zinc oxide has about tenfold more surface area. So uh, we start at around about that tenfold less, but it really does depend on the type of uh, pathogen and I know in the US at the moment, for example, um, the genotype there aren't as robust to hemolytic E. coli. So anything from uh, 300 grams to 500 grams uh, per tonne, depending on that challenge, but also depending on weaning age. And again, we really need to focus on the, uh, the acid binding capacity of the diet. Uh, if the, the acid binding capacity is a little higher, you haven't got enough acids or you're adding a bit more limestone, even with the water, it might have a lot more calcium, et cetera, in it. Then we'll need to go to the higher levels of uh, the high zox or the potentiated zinc oxide. Yeah, I feel like the acid binding capacity topic has been a pretty hot topic in the, the last um, this season, I guess you could say, of this podcast because I think I've had 
two or three episodes at least that have discussed acid binding capacity. And, it, and it, you're right. It's kind of funny how zinc oxide works because it's kind of contradicts itself and its antimicrobial effects in that regard in terms of acid binding capacity because it's innately, obviously, has a large antimicrobial effect and that's why we feed it to nursery pigs. Um, but it actually increases the acid binding capacity of the diet, which then reduces the diets, I guess you could say, basal antimicrobial effect that it has. Um, and so it kind of it kind of contradicts itself. Obviously, the antimicrobial effect it naturally has zinc oxide is obviously going to offset the acid binding capacity factor. But being able to utilize kind of both and double dip a little bit in a way and the antimicrobial effect of having the zinc oxide, but still maintaining antimicro or um, excuse me, still maintaining the acid binding capacity of the diet. Um, I can see how that would definitely be helpful for those nursery pigs, especially when they're dealing with E. coli or other sort of disease challenge at that age. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it's almost threefold where uh, you're adding in a high surface area zinc oxide. So you're not, you're reducing the acid binding capacity by doing that. Number two, that uh, you've basically got uh, two and a half kilograms of extra room in the diet. So you can actually reduce the cost of the diet because you can put in a cheaper carrier, for example, put in a few more amino acids, extra energy. And then the, the third one is, uh, unfortunately, high levels of zinc do increase levels of antibiotic, antibiotic resistance genes in the environment and not as bad as antibiotics themselves. But reducing the level of zinc oxide by tenfold is going to really limit and help reduce the antibiotic resistance genes in, in the environment like that. And as we see in Europe, uh, they've gone to maximum total zinc of 150 ppm. So it's crucial to be able to use these high surface area zinc oxides for, for, for those situations where they're quite restricted. But yes, you're certainly right in what you say. Yeah. And speaking of Europe, like you, like you mentioned, they've, they've introduced this 150 parts per million zinc oxide cap to partly fight back on the antimicrobial resistance um, that it can provide, but also from an environmental standpoint, um, trying to reduce the amount of uh, mineral runoff that can occur as a result of overfeeding this. And from what you've told me, I mean, I don't know too much, obviously, just from this, the seven minutes we've talked so far, but it sounds like with feeding a lot less of this, that would then translate into a greatly reduced runoff and environmental impact from feeding zinc oxide? Oh, most certainly. I mean, in Australia, uh, our soils are very old and very deficient in zinc. But as we know in Europe, after so many uh, hundreds of years of agriculture where, yeah, the, um, that is very important to limit the amount of, let's say, uh, those type of minerals like the zincs and copper, which have built up over time. And yeah, that's quite important. Uh, and then there's other strategies where they need to really look at because uh, at 150 ppm of, of zinc, you're reliant on that amount of zinc in the going down the gut into the the, uh, the ileum, and you need that high levels of zinc, higher surface area really help that. But then there's other strategies where we really need to look at acidifiers and uh, other pr uh, products, whether it is the uh, the polyphenols and and other strategies which are effective against uh, E. coli as well, uh, but still using that base of the high surface areas in oxide, the high zox to, to do that. Gotcha. And just to, I guess, picture it a little bit, when you talk about this high surface area zinc oxide, um, I'm trying to imagine like an actual image of the molecule um, or the compound. So I guess what, what is the structure really shaped like that gives it this high surface area? Is it just like a bunch of like waves and valleys or how, how is it shaped exactly to maximize its surface area? Yeah, yeah, good, good question. <clears throat> so the uh, pharmaceutical zinc oxide, and even if they go to nanoparticle size, uh, it is like a big block uh, of sand next to no or very uh, no pores at all. So through the process, uh, the manufacturers of, of Hyzox, they're basically able to explode it 
and put it back together through a, a, um, a drying process, which is like a, a labyrinth of caves and uh, crystalline structure and honeycomb um, uh, structure, I suppose, is probably the better way to, to type the picture it. So it allows the acid and to get the best effect out of this, this type of product is uh, in a lower acid environment, that means that releases more of the, the zinc 2 plus ions. And that's why uh, we get the surface area, that labyrinth of caves and crystalline honeycomb type structure that you, know, you see in a beehive, for example. Combining basic science with real world facilities results in swine nutrition programs that deliver impactful bottom line performance. Hubbard Feeds is focused on helping you achieve your goals and make your life easier along the way. Choose a company that can match your appetite for innovation by visiting hubbardfeeds.com forward slash swine research. Gotcha. Well, I believe that's all we have time for. So thank you again, David, for coming on the show and sharing all this with us. Fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yep. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine nutrition related research trial and would like to come on the show and share it with us, feel free to email the details about your research to hello at wisenetics.com. <laughs> <laughs>